Hi everybody, it's Sarah Cray and I teach watercolor and today we are doing our gather project. Ooh. Ooh. Ah, we have Michael here working the cameras. Hello everyone. And for this project, I really wanted to have something that was more like that dreamy, vintage, like basket, picking fruit, putting it, you know, a picnic, that kind of like dreamy um, quality. So we're going for desaturated colors and um, a lot of fun. You guys ready? Ready. Okay, we're gonna be doing this project in six steps. So our very first step is we are going to be putting in the shadows on our blanket. Our second step is we will be painting the stripes on our blanket. Our third step is we will be doing the first layer of the basket. Our fourth step is we will put in our kumquats. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes. And our fifth step is we will go back into our basket, add some texture and shadows. And then our very last step is any finishing details that we need. Um, I'm using three paint, brush paint brushes for this project, around two, around six, and around 12. Um, please use what you have though. I'm also using Holbein soft tape. There is an outline with this. There's a lot of lines on this project, so take your time tracing it. And remember that outlines are guides. You are free to change and adjust it. It's just a starting point for you. It's not a coloring book, okay? Love it. Um, I am using five colors for this project. So our very first color is lemon yellow. Our second color is honey brown. Our third color is red. Our fourth color is Tahoe blue. And our very last color is Payne's gray. That red is just called red. It's just red. <laughs> I'm gonna call it mm, strawberry red, just to give it some flair. I named these colors and I thought it would be fun to name paint colors. It's not fun, it's very stressful. And people ask me questions about it all the time. And I'm like, I have no good answers for you. <laughs> There's a sweet girl that she would, uh, she came to visit and she was just like, why did you name emerald green emerald? Because it's actually not emerald. And I'm like, this is really embarrassing. I thought it was emerald. <laughs> <laughs> Emeralds are green. This is green. I thought that, I don't know what I was thinking, but these are valid questions and I have no good answers for you. You named Tahoe blue that because Tahoe is the best place on earth. Yes. We're near, we're from near that area. Okay. So we are going to do our oath and then we will start painting, all right? So if you can raise your right hand and repeat after me, I promise to be kind to myself. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare I my work. I promise not to compare my work. And I promise to have fun. I promise to have fun. Whoa. <laughs> okay, um, and I do want to acknowledge that you probably noticed that this painting doesn't have a background and you might be like, well, why didn't you put a background in there? There's a couple reasons. The first one is I try to be aware of how long projects take and this one already had a lot of length to it. Um, so I thought if you guys wanna add a background, you are free to, but I like paintings that are kind of just like against a white paper. Um, so it didn't bother me, but I wanted to be aware of time. The second reason is because um, you don't necessarily think about this, but adding backgrounds to paintings actually change the level of difficulty because you have to think about how values relate to each other in the world that you're creating. And so when you add a background, you have to think about how that background relates to the subject, relates to the world, and that all of those things make sense. Um, so for me, I feel like when you add backgrounds to scenes, it's always a level um, it adds a level of difficulty. So I still wanted to make this approachable, but please know that like, even just doing like a textured background, uh, maybe just dropping in color, that kind of stuff, you're free to do that. I mean, you're the artist, you can do whatever you want. So I'm just gonna kind of like set this up and you guys are free to take this wherever you want it to go. Okay? Love it. Great. So. That's my mantra today, mantra. Mantra. Love it. Mantra. I don't know. Now I'm well, questioning I'm a man, myself. So it's a mantra. Mantra. Okay, um, we're gonna put our shadows in first on our blanket. That's our very first step. So I'm gonna take my round 12 and I'm going to try and mix together a neutral, warm gray. So I'm gonna take 12. I'm gonna grab some honey. And my color started to bleed a little bit together over here, but I'm not that mad about it because. I'm gonna mix so many colors together. It's just, it's all gonna be a mixture here. I put in some Payne's Gray and I'm gonna grab, see how that turned it kind of a green color. 
I'm gonna add some of that red to neutralize that green. So now that's more of just a brown. So I'm gonna do more Payne's Gray to desaturate that brown. And then you can always test it. Adding water to a neutral that you're mixing will always make the undertone colors pop up. So that is pretty good. It's still a little bit more pink than I would like. So I'm gonna add even more Payne's Gray. There we go. That feels better. It pains gray me to say it, but yes, it does. You're good at those puns. I, I really love puns. I'm not really great at coming up with them. Our daughter's good at them. Yeah, she is. She really is. Okay, so let's start. So I'm going to keep using my 12, and then I'm going to, you can look at your reference photo, you can look at your outline, but I'm going to think, okay, when you put an object on something, there's always going to be a darker value around it because that object is a form that is casting shadow. So right underneath this basket here and here, and then also underneath these um, kumquats, there will be a shadow. And then I'm also thinking about the blanket itself. When you have different planes and the blanket goes up and down and wrinkles, we communicate that by shifting the values. So I'm looking at where there are wrinkles. So there's one here, and this will be a darker value. And so I wanna put all I want to try and get as much of the shadow in correctly now. So then after I put in the stripes, I don't have to try and work around the blue stripes, okay? So go a little bit darker than you might think because when you put a value down on a white piece of paper, it's gonna stand out like crazy. Even a light wash is gonna stand out. And then as you add more values, that wash that you thought was dark actually like lightens up compared to like a dark value that you add later. So I have learned with watercolor, it's good to go a little bit darker than you might feel comfortable going when you're adding these shadows on that first round. So I like to put the color down first and then I dip my brush to pick up clean water, blot it on my paper towel and then blend out so I can try and get a nice transition. See how it goes from no value to a little bit of value into more value. That being able to achieve that transition um, is a little bit tricky, but it will come with practice. So if you can't get it right away, don't stress. Okay, and then underneath these guys. And then this little blanket back here. And there's a slight one on the side. And then you can even have like, you see where this blanket waves right here? You can tell by the line work how it curves. Mm -hmm. If you want, you can add like a tiny bit of shadow right into that curve. But make it a lighter value than the basket. The basket shadow is going to be a darker value than like the blanket shadows. Don't forget to blend those out. And it's okay if you accidentally go over your kumquats a little bit, because we're gonna be painting over those anyway. And I'm just gonna do one more, just right at this basket edge, a slightly darker shadow. So just one more layer. because shadows are darkest right underneath the object, and then they kind of diffuse out. Okay, I feel like that is a good start. Know that like later on as we add the lines and stuff, if you need to go back and adjust your shadows, you can. It's just trickier because you have to like work around the blue stripes. <laughs> so it's possible, it's just kind of a pain. All right, and then I'm gonna dry it using my Heat It Craft Tool which really speeds up the painting process. 
Although I will say that like for me who painted with watercolor for years and years and years before I even picked up one of these things, um, it was, I learned how to just move around the painting. So instead of waiting for that to dry, I would have just immediately gone and painted my kumquats while that was going and I would have just worked in the different spaces. So there's value to not having those kinds of tools because you just like are, learn to be more efficient with your time. Have you ever um, eaten a kumquat? I feel like I have. I feel like they're like, like uh, hard. Yeah, you eat the, I, I haven't tried one, but you eat the peel. You like eat, it's like a little grape. Yeah, but I feel like the, like the meat itself is not squishy like a grape. Oh, really? I don't know. Google it. Weird. Yeah, look it up. Okay, so now I'm gonna mix. I love this color so much, this like robin egg blue kind of vintage color. So it, but our dandelion paints are super vibrant. So we wanna try and like tone that down a lot. So I'm gonna grab some azure blue. I'm gonna grab some honey brown. That's gonna turn it green. Too much green. So I'm gonna add some blue back in. So it's kind of like this teal color. Then I'm gonna add some red. Okay, so that like darkens it. And now I'm gonna add water to that and I'm gonna see where our color kind of ended up. This is leaning a bit more green, I can tell already. But look how pretty that color is. I mean, that's a pretty color already. I do want it slightly more blue, so I'm gonna grab a tiny, tiny bit more Azure. No, sorry, Tahoe. If I said Azure this whole time, I meant Tahoe. So I'm mixing more blue in there. And let's add some water to it because it's a very light color. Yeah, ooh, there we go. Now, um, just a little tip for you guys. As you guys are mixing color and playing with values, um, with watercolor, your, um, how you get lighter values is you add more water. That doesn't mean you pick up more water on your brush. That means you bring water to your palette and mix it in with your colors on your palette, and then that is what you pick up to paint with. That way you can control your values instead of being like, I hope this is enough water. Okay, so you wanna make sure this is dry. And I'm gonna grab this light value, blue, and I'm just gonna start painting <laughs> my stripes. <laughs> it says, uh, the kumquat fruit, the skin is waxy, the flesh inside is a combination of sweet and sour with a texture of like a hard grape. So it, yeah, it's a little bit it's harder. Like a firm, firm fleshy feel. Yeah. Okay, now when you put in these stripes, because we're painting on the shadows and because watercolor is transparent, you should be able to see like that color underneath. So the color of this is gonna be different than the color over here because we're painting straight on the shadow. And then to like get that extra feel of depth, you wanna make sure that you um, add just a touch of a darker value right where that line meets the basket because that's where the shadow is strongest. So you have to think about how shadows on objects are consistent. So there'll be a shadow on the white part and a shadow on the blue part, okay? The trickiest thing about painting stripes is not skipping an area. <laughs> <laughs> Doing two big white stripes in a row. Yes. That's a great color you got. Thank you, I'm obsessed with it personally. I really wanted it to feel like, um, it kind of reminds me of Michael's, uh, Michael's grandma. I feel like she loves this kind of striped pattern and she has like vintage baskets and um, I don't know, kind of reminded me of her. When you were introducing the project, I was gonna say it reminds me of a grandma in a picnic in the 20s, you know? Yeah, and like tea stained towels yeah. and that kind of thing. Okay, so now I put in my stripes here. I'm loving the colors that I'm getting and it's just so different than what we usually do because it's kind of like that desaturated tones which um, it's fun to mix it up. Now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna paint the stripes on the rest of my blanket. Um, what I like to do, how do I say this? Try and switch up the blue stripes so then they're not aligned with the ones that we've already painted 
You know what I mean? So if you're not sure where to start, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna paint this stripe here and then kind of work my way out. And the reason why for that is because when there's a fold in the blanket, the stripes are gonna be going in different directions and not line up. And so if you don't line them up, it just is easier for the viewer to know that it's like a different fold and plane. With all the paintings you paint, mm -hmm. what percentage do you think other people's eyes land on? Do you think there's a lot of paintings you paint that just end up never seeing the light of day? Me? Yeah. Oh yeah. Like how, what percent? Like 50, 50? Not anymore. Probably like when I was first painting, there were so many paintings that never saw the light of day, probably at least 50%. So we have drawers full of, yeah. you know, just old paintings. But now because painting is my job <laughs> and because I have like Instagram and stuff like that, um, I always show what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not something that turns into anything, I'll usually still share in my stories or post about it because I think it's good to share what you're making. But it wasn't always that way. Did it bother you when people didn't see them or did you just no. like doing it just for doing it? It was just doing it for just for doing it. That's why um, I love, I know people get, how do I say this? Like these are liquid watercolors, which is what I learned watercolor on and really what made me fall in love with watercolor. But they're not light fast, which means if you put them in direct sunlight, they will fade over time, which is actually pretty common for paints. Dye-based paints just do it faster than pigment-based paints. Right. And that never bothered me. And for some people, that's a real issue. And for me, it's more like I don't paint things because I think it's going to hang on a wall forever or because I want it to be a family heirloom. Not that those things are bad, but that's not why I do it. I do it because I just love to paint. And making something, even if it's not frame worthy, um, is worth it to me. So it, it doesn't bother me at all. That's why all those paintings that I have, they're still in drawers. Like they will always probably stay in drawers because it's just... Until our house burns down. Probably, <laughs> yeah. Overstuffing paper. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a tinderbox with all that paper. In. It is funny. I do remember that... I'm sorry, you can cut me off at any point. But I do remember people talking about the light fastness. I, I've always had two thoughts about that. One, the sun destroys everything. Like, it does. It ruins the paint on your car. And yeah. that stuff is thick and, you know, made of every chemical known to man. And two, sometimes a beautiful part about art is that it's impermanent. I mean, we definitely learned about that in the Wabi Sabi month where that's part of the beauty of it, the fact that it is impermanent. And I don't want to like, how do I say this? I want to teach you guys the correct thing. So if your goal is to paint something that is museum Archive. archival quality, then yes, you should pay attention to the paints, the paper, how you save it, all of that kind of stuff. That's very important. But we're learning here. And I feel like when you try to focus too much on the materials to make sure it lasts forever, you almost lose that, that, how do I say this? When you don't care, you are way more free in experimenting and trying and doing something new. And so I, I don't love to focus so much on um, how this won't last forever in the way of that being a bad thing personally. I find that incredibly freeing. And so, um, and I just need to call out that I'm getting to the stripes in this heavily shadowed area and my wash, actually my tracing was light enough that after I did my wash, I lost my stripes. So I'm just eyeballing it. I'm just, who cares? You know, like it's gonna be fine. But if that happens to you, just like be like, oh yeah, her sure, here's a stripe and we'll just keep on going like we know what we're doing. <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah, it's just, I like to call attention to the fact that when you are not worried about something staying pristine, you experiment. And I really feel like when you play and you experiment, that's when you find your own style. That's when you fall in love with the medium. And if you fall in love with the process and the medium, you will always do it. And then that skill set that you're going for and trying for and killing yourself for, it will just come because that just comes with time, practice. Um, you guys 
I don't know if you know this or not, Sarah's probably the most creative person I know. So I always ask her about like the well of inspiration because I, a normal person, feel like I don't have it all the time. So I'm just curious, like, you know, and we recently watched this video and uh, this guy was giving his tips for life. He's an older gentleman, very great video. And he was just saying, there was one that stuck out to me and he said that when you want to create, you can't be two things at once. You can't be a writer and an editor or you'll never write a word. Mm -hmm. That's what this talk reminds me of. You can't be a museum archivist and a painter. You can't be worrying. To, I mean, maybe, but like, it's a it's a huge, I don't know, equation to stifle yourself. If you're really worried about the technicalities of where this painting will be in 10 years, you're not focusing on the painting, on the creativity, and then like, I don't know, that inspiration. For me, again, a normal person with normal <laughs> art inspiration, <laughs> I feel like that's where mine goes. I worry about, you know. What is this going to look like? What's this going to turn out like? What's the reception? And then I just get paralysis. Well, and I think what what the focus should be, and I, I just need to call out that when you're moving, when you're doing the stripes on the top, when you go to the bottom, it's possible that we have inconsistencies in our stripes. That's okay. Just keep painting. Just try and like stay on top of it as you can. But even when I was painting this, I'm like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> um I would say that like, at least when it comes to, there's a period of painting to like kind of explore and to develop and to learn. And then once you feel really good about where that is at, if that's where your focus is, is making sure that, okay, I wanna make sure my daughter can keep this painting forever or something like that. Like, Which is noble. And which is, that. there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. It's just more like you, in my mind, it's like you have to think with, they need to be two separate things. And the other thing that's important to remember is you don't know that it's your best work until it's hindsight. So I never go into a painting saying, this is gonna be the best painting I'm ever gonna make. I never approach a painting that way because then I would never actually, <laughs> then I would like second guess every decision that I'm making. But it's not until after things are painted that I can look at that and I can say, oh, that one is really good or that one's good, but it's just not my favorite. And allow yourself the freedom to look at a new piece of paper as an opportunity and then decide what it is after. Don't decide what it is before because that expectation and that fear is going to stop you from doing your best work. So always approach a painting as this can work out great or this can end up in the trash and that is part of the process. Did that relate to what you were saying? Absolutely. Okay, great. <laughs> I just had this moment of being like, wait a second. The theme was creating, so we could go any direction. <laughs> okay, now I'm going into the stripes in the shadows part, and I just want to like call out, I love um, how these shadows are showing up on this blanket now. Do you see that, how it's already getting some dimension? If you want to add a little bit of extra like va-va-voom, you can, like what we did over here, just right where these stripes are coming out of this basket, you can add one more layer, maybe right underneath here too. Just to like accentuate, but you don't want it to feel so much darker that it feels separate. We're not here to exclude. That's right. That blanket, you're part of the whole. We're, you're part of it. Gosh, I love this color. It turned out, it's slightly more green than my reference, but I'm not mad about it. It reminds me of like a beach house throw blanket. Yes. Yes. <laughs> if anyone has a house in uh, Northern California Beach, they would love to give to us. Yes. Please. <laughs> Please. Contact me. <laughs> <laughs> I will make you homemade bread for the rest of your life. Michael does make an amazing homemade bread. Okay, I feel really good about where my blanket has arrived. And I'm gonna let that dry before I mess, before I like do anything else with that. I just wanna call out that like, I totally went off script on the stripes over here and they did not line up well. And can you even really tell? Not really. So just let it go, okay? All right, step number three is we are gonna be putting in our basket, our first layer of basket. So again, our challenge here is mixing like a desaturated color 
Um, I do have some lovely tan brown here already from when we did our shadows, and I'm just gonna like build off of that. So I want this to read neutral, but warm neutral, like baskets are, you know? And there's so much variation in baskets. If you want it to be dark, you can. If you want it to be like really, sometimes like the brown tends to lean red or yellow. Play with it, it's up to you. I have thoughts about the stripes not lining up. Okay. And we've talked about something similar a lot before, but <laughs> can you imagine? I, Cause you're always critical of your thing. You're like, these stripes don't line up, people are gonna notice, mm -hmm. right? Put yourself in those shoes and imagine you go to your friend's house, your dear friend, and they painted this thing and later in the car on the drive home, you're like, did you even see her stripe? <laughs> they didn't even line up. Like that never exists anywhere. No, yeah. <laughs> no one does that. So I added, um, I have a comment about that, but I'm gonna add, I added a little bit of lemon yellow, a little bit of honey brown and a little bit of red. And I have three different kind of colors that I'm gonna pull from because I even like the variation within that kind of tan color. And so what I'm going to do taking my 12 is I'm just gonna pick up some color and then these sections, I'm just gonna kind of like put them in. And we're gonna be painting on top of this so it does not need to be perfect. And I am lifting my brush because I want it to feel like the woven, you know what I mean? That they're separate from each other and not a solid smooth um, line. So I am lifting my brush. So what you said, Michael, about how like no one does that, that doesn't exist. And I, that's true, but also it does exist sometimes in the way of if that happens and somebody says something to you or even about your painting, it has absolutely nothing to do with you. And it has everything to do with the relationship that they have with themselves. And I'm saying that in the way of, honestly, maybe five or 10 years ago, I could have been really critical of someone's art. And um, that's because I was insecure about my own art. That, that's because I was insecure about um, the lack of art that I was making. And so when I saw someone else doing it and I thought that it wasn't as good, I'd be like, who do they think they are kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. But that has absolutely nothing to do with them. They're not doing anything wrong. They're being wonderful and amazing. And it was my relationship with how I viewed myself that made it so I was more critical than I needed to be and not um, encouraging <laughs> and um, kind of like not very nice. And I think that's why I spend so much, how do I say this? It wasn't until I became okay with who I was as an artist, as a person, that I realized um, how critical I was of everyone else. And then that opened me up to kindness and love because I then started to love myself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So... I just want to say, like, if that does, if that experience does happen to you, because we can't pretend like there's not going to be someone who is not critical of our work. I see it sometimes in the Facebook group where people are like, I was really excited about this. And, you know, they made this comment and I just feel so deflated. And that happens. And um, but don't ever look at that as an opportunity to stop and recognize that whatever that person says about what it is that you're making has nothing to do with you and only to do with them. I wonder if this thought that you just shared is kind of universal amongst, I don't want to say professional artists, but artists who have been doing it a long time because I work with you and Jesse and Nicole who are all vastly different in creating styles mm -hmm. and presentation styles, but I feel like all three of you will handle... Um, critiques very well and I know that when you were in school for it it's something that you have to learn to do mm -hmm. but I wonder if it's just something that kind of thick skinness is something that comes with doing art for a long time because you start to recognize that people's comments aren't necessarily about you they're about them mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying yes and also when you make art for a long time I do not associate my value as an artist with a painting so like if someone says, your basket lines are super messed up, <laughs> like who do you think you are teaching this? Which sometimes like you get people that comment like, I can't believe that you're teaching things like this because you obviously have no idea what or you're doing. Or how I hold a brush. Or how I hold a brush, all of those things. Um, 
that one instance does not define my whole experience. And I know that like, I'm not interested. I'm not saying yes, how I'm doing it is the only way, is the correct way, is I'm just showing you how I do it. And if that doesn't work for what you wanna do, well, that's okay. And I also know that like this one painting that I'm doing right here is not the end all be all of my art career. So there, it comes with like the more art you make, the more paintings that you do, the more you recognize that there's just always more opportunity to do more. And so the one painting that doesn't turn out or the one thing that somebody doesn't like, in, that, in the long run, when you look at it from above of your entire career, doesn't matter. These are thought-provoking questions, my dear. I mean, I want to keep going, but I feel like we've been talking. <laughs> well, we're just painting. I'm just painting in sections of the basket. And I don't know if I mentioned this. Michael's my husband. That's why I'm calling <laughs> him, like, my dear and stuff like that. Yeah, we were married for a little bit. Yeah. Um, I guess my last little point to be made kind of on this whole topic is even if someone is very critical of something, you know, you're working on projects all the time. And, like, let's say, like, a book, for example, and it needs, you know, 15 paintings in this book and you really don't like one of them sarah mm -hmm. cray doesn't like the paintings she made there's a very 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 solid chance that a lot of people will think that one's their favorite because mm -hmm. it happens with me and you a lot where you send me you know here's this month's projects and you're like i'm not sure about this one and in my head i'm like oh well that one's my my favorite actually mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know so like tastes are so subjective mm -hmm. good and bad are not objective qualities about a painting Right. It's very rare that people agree on something. And even the most famous, the Mona Lisa, someone doesn't like it. Yeah. Someone's like, well, I think it sucks. Yeah. <laughs> but like, if you paint a painting that achieves that level of, you know, renown, I guess that's as close to objectively good as you can get. And still people don't like it. Yeah. So don't be so hard on yourself. Someone yes. likes it. Your mom will like it. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, that's very true. And something that I have to remind myself of too. And actually that's why I'm grateful for like Michael and um, some of the team here at Let's Make Art where when I'm designing a box, I'll like send a preview, you know, and be like, oh, this is what I'm, this is what I'm thinking, but I really am not sure about that last project. I think I'm going to redo it. And um, actually that happened with the Wabi Sabi box. I was not going to do that Queen Anne's Lace project. I just, it was so fun to make, but I just was like, people aren't gonna like this. <laughs> I just like got in my head too much. And then I showed um, the team here and they were like, oh, leave it, that's so, and so like, it's good to have um, another eye that you trust looking at what it is that you're doing. It, and I say that you trust because that's important um, because they kind of just, help you get out of your head too. And every month Michael sees what I'm making, I send him pictures or I'm like, okay, this is, this is June, this is whatever. And um, I, sometimes I'll be like, this looks like a wolf, right? Like I'm doing this, <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, uh, that is very obviously a wolf. And I'm like, okay, okay, I'm just like in my head too much. My favorite response to send her is when she sends me like a picture of a flower or, you know, a bunny. I'll say, what kind of dog is that? <laughs> just to be funny. I okay. do have a queen. Sorry, you go. You go. You go. Um, I just want to say that, like, now I'm getting to the lip of the basket. And um, try and keep the lip, like this part, a little bit more even in value and color because that is one continuous line. Um, and then when you get to this edge right here, I want to use a slightly darker value to show that it's a different plane so that it goes top and then this side. So I'm just gonna grab more of that mixture. I'm still using my 12, but if you would feel better using a six, go for it. You can use whatever brush you feel most comfortable using. The name of those baskets just came back to me, like hit me like a rock. What is it? Longa burger. Longa burger. Longa burger basket. Is that the baskets that your mom and grandma have? Yes. Because that's what I was thinking of when yes. I made this. They were like a 
I think they're pricey. So like, it was like, okay, what should we get mom for Christmas kind of thing? I think they are pricey too, because your mom gave us one. And then I think it was like, I didn't know that baskets yeah. could be expensive. Yeah, just threw good junk And I just was like throwing junk in it. And she was just like, Sarah. <laughs> she was just like, that basket's expensive. If you don't want it, I'll take it back. And I was just like, oh, I had no idea. And so now I try and be very aware of how I treat my baskets. Yeah, I didn't know until I went to buy her a you know, birthday present in adulthood. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Well, I can paint one. I can't <laughs> buy you one, but I can paint you one. <laughs> it's better. Okay, so I did the lip. I'm also gonna do the handle now. Now you have to think about a handle is not paper thin, right? All of this has thickness to it. So on the top here, I'm gonna do a darker value and I just want you to continue the line. It curves around so it gets a little bit. So I just wanna go through that with you. We're gonna paint this and then that goes around. And then the lighter value kind of ends right here and then we'll see it pick back up a tiny bit over there, okay? Uh, oh, I remember what I was gonna say. Yeah. Um, I watched the Queen Anne's Lace tutorial because I love Queen Anne's Lace and I had an addendum. For all you super fans who watched that, I was saying this to my screen and now I have the platform to say it out loud. Carrots, and Queen Anne's Lace are the same actual species. They're not the same family. They're like the same exact thing. A Queen Anne's Lace on the side of the road is a botanical carrot. What? The difference is humans have taken them into domestic hood and Queen Anne's Lace only produces every other year and a domestic carrot produces every year. So they're the same botanical everything, name, subspecies, whatever. What? Queen Anne's Lace is carrots. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Don't you love them? Yes, yeah. I really do. I think zombie apocalypse thoughts all summer long, so I'm like, we'd be fine. <laughs> See carrots all year. Okay, I'm gonna let that dry before I try to attempt to do the like actual um, handle part because I don't want those colors bleeding in. Remember, this does not have to be perfect. We are gonna be doing a ton of texture and layers on top, so pretty much almost all of this we'll be painting over. Um, yes. That is all. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna actually, I'll come back to that part because I wanna give it some good time to dry. And I'm gonna move on to painting the kumquats. So I'm going to mix, I wanna do like um, orange, but we don't have orange. So we're gonna mix orange by red and yellow. Lemon yellow and red, let's see what color we get. Rambunctious Ooh. red, you mean. Yep, is that the new name for it? I don't know, I'm, I'm testing them out. Okay, so I wanna add some water to it to get a light color. And then I also want to mix like a darker orange, uh, which is actually brown. And that's what we'll do for like the more shadowed elements. Now I'm not going for photorealism on these kumquats, but I do like to have at least two or three values to show, give a slight hint of form. So I'm going to actually take some honey brown and red. And let's see. That's a little bit just brown. I want it to be like a darker value. Those values are actually looking the same. So I'm gonna grab some Payne's gray, maybe some more red. Your brown is dark orange, less than change my life. <laughs> it is funny how we classify colors, you know? Like yeah. dark orange got its own name. Or light brown got its own name, pick one, you know? Yeah. Okay, kumquats. We're gonna start by doing Taking this orange, adding some water to it, and just using a 12 to paint that in. But again, use whatever size brush you feel comfortable using. And then let's see what happens if we just drop in, this is kind of more my medium orange, medium value orange. So I'm not doing an even wash. I'm kind of just guiding the paint around, but like around the top here, I want this to stay this light value. So if you need to lift some of that color out to keep that light, you can. And then the other color, we'll just let that go. I'm not gonna put the dark in yet. I wanna let that dry for a second before I do. And then we are going to do the other one. And I'm just keeping a super thin line between them so the colors don't blend. And because 
Um, I'm the artist, I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> but if you don't like that, you can wait for it to dry and then go back to it and um, have no line in between. Okay, oh, let's make some more orange. And think about how much variation there is in nature. So I, I'll mix colors, but I also mix them as I go. So then if this orange is slightly more yellow or it's slightly more red, that doesn't bother me because I know in nature that's actually what happens is there is variation in color and shape, all of it. Drop some of this down here. I think citrus flowers rank very highly for me. And it's not that they're necessarily super beautiful. They are pretty, but they just smell so good. Yeah, they do. Oh, like we used to have a lemon tree in our backyard, and like in the spring, it just smelled like heaven. I loved it. Sorry, I'm like trying to paint this very small area, so I'm focusing. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing on our basket ones. So I'm going to just mix more orange, so I got a big chunk to pull from. Okay, there we go. And if you work quickly, you can do like all of the values at once. So like right now, I'm gonna be doing like the lighter value orange across the whole kumquat. And then I can just pick up my brush and just keep going. Again, leaving thin white lines around because I can. I think I might actually switch to my six. That. Sometimes if you batch areas, it's just a little bit easier to paint quickly. I actually really like the shape of the kumquat leaves as well. Those were really fun to paint. And then now that it's kind of like had a second to dry, I can drop in a little bit of this darker value. Now, if you, I kind of want the paint to diffuse out um, and I'm okay with a little bit of unknown. So I don't mind dropping in some dark values and just kind of letting it move. I can guide it, but in the end, it's gonna like do its own thing. Where if you want precise shadows um, and kind of like that full control over where they go, and how they kind of react, um, then you would want to wait for your thing to dry completely, and then you can add those in there. And if you want like a little bit of extra richness of orange, um, what I like to do is while it's nice and wet, I can drop in, I dropped in some yellow right there, see how it's really vibrant compared to this one. You can also drop in a tiny bit like of red it just depends on how like vibrant you want it to be. And again, try and make those lines as thin as possible. If they touch a little bit, it's not the end of the world, but if they're too thick, then it will actually um, like mess with the composition. So try and thin them out. Okay. And you can see my orange blooded a little bit into my basket edge. That's okay. I'll go back and I'll like tighten that up. You okay, my dear? So good. I'm giving the listeners a little uh, mental break. <laughs> Topics. I like your questions. But if there is 
<clears throat> Sometimes it's nice just to get lost in the repetitive motions of sharpening color. Now here, so whenever like, this is a weird spot, right? Cause there's not enough space to do like a full kumquat. So whenever that happens, you just have to imagine that there is stuff behind there. So don't paint like, oh, I gotta do a shape. You just kind of fill in the space. Okay. Don't think. Best fruit, what? Oh gosh, my immediate response in my brain was strawberries, but that's not my favorite. That's mm. funny. Hmm. What's your subconscious's favorite? I guess so. Do you have a favorite? Mm. I mean, I think like botanical fruit, probably corn. People would probably classify that as a vegetable, but. It's not a vegetable? <laughs> vegetable comes from the body of a plant. So like the root, like a carrot is a, a vegetable. A carrot's a, I like a rhizome or something. But anyways, like, like broccoli, well, that's even hairy. <laughs> things that are like the stalk of the plant like a green onion is a vegetable but corn grows on the stalk of a plant corn is the result of a corn flower that's been pollinated in it oh a piece of corn i didn't know that there were corn flowers i pointed them out to you you can see they just look like hair <laughs> you're like you never pay attention to me <laughs> <laughs> you drive along the side of the road and you see oh like, yeah 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 sunset-y color uh -huh. on top of the corn yeah i know what you're talking There's about corn flowers there is an actual um, subgenre of flowers not related to corn that are called corn flowers that are true blue, which is really. Famous. Anyways, back to the regular corn. Um, I think like of the classical fruits, I think an apple's most versatile, man. Hmm. It's hard to beat, or like a really fresh orange. Apples aren't my favorite. You don't like the texture. You're very texturally based. I am. Okay, I will also. I just need to acknowledge that I feel like kumquats are egg shaped. So sometimes when I look at this, I'm like, these are eggs. <laughs> but they can be eggs. That's cute too, a basket of eggs. Oh, you could do like all the different like <laughs> robin egg blue and like that brown and that tan and the white that you get from laying them at home. That would be cute. That would be great for Easter. Look at that, okay. You guys are bored at home. Look up a black copper Moran, M-A-R-A-N chicken. They lay like almost black eggs. They're so beautiful. They are really beautiful. Okay, now I'm finally putting in this handle. Handle. Get a handle on it. Putting a handle on my handle. And I'm just using my six. And then this little side back here, we want it to be actually a darker value because it's kind of like hidden against the basket. And I gotta mix more. Tan color. You know what I want science to point towards is a seedless blackberry. Because blackberry flavor is undeniably good. Those seeds are obnoxious. I mean, I think seeds are just part of it. But you don't like seeds. But if they weren't part of it, it'd be better. <laughs> Make it. Okay, so I'm gonna mix green now for my leaves. We can use Tahoe blue. You can mix that with lemon yellow or um, honey brown. And depending on how like vibrant you want your green or how light or dark. You can also add paint, paints gray to kind of like darken it up to give it like this foresty green color, which is what I just did. What's mixing right there. And so I am going to just use my six and kind of drop this in. I like to do a light wash with like a hint of another color. Let's drop in some honey actually. And the reason why I'm going for honey instead of lemon is lemon is very, very like yellow, vibrant, like almost highlighter, but not quite. Where honey has like a warmer, golder tone. And so just like the colors that we're using for this painting, I felt like the honey would lend itself a little bit better than the uh, lemon. But this is your painting, so do whatever you want. Okay, I'm gonna let that dry for a second. And we're gonna do these leaves over here. Painting leaves is some of my favorite things to paint. I just love them. You can drop in a little bit of color. Leaves, I always give myself permission to play with wet on wet 
there's just such a beautiful open space to play. So I take it. Okay. And then when you fill in the belly of a leaf, you wanna use the side of your brush because it's just a thicker stroke. It fills in faster. And then when you get to the edges and the tip, I like to work using the tip of my brush so I can get a nice point and it allows me to have thin lines. And then this guy. Okay, and then I'm gonna go back to this first one. I mean, that color is actually really beautiful, but I just wanna darken it a little bit. So kind of right where it's coming out. And then you can either paint around the middle to create the vein, or if your leaf is like a light green enough, once it dries, you can go back in and add a dark center, which is kind of what I did in this reference photo here. I like to do both. I have like, it has to be this one way. Gosh, that color, that green is just so pretty. Okay, add some more over here. As much or as little as you want, maybe you really like the light green, there's nothing wrong. You are the artist. And I think so much of painting how do I say this? I get questions a lot where people are like, will I ever reach a point where I'm not watching tutorials and I can paint on my own? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, but so much of that is learning to trust the voice inside that's telling you what to do. And when we're new to something, when somebody's like, when our like inside voice is like, you should try this, or I don't know what to do, so I shouldn't try it all. Um, but if you just stop and learn to listen to it, you're that much closer to making your own art. You actually get to a point where you actively don't watch other things mm -hmm. or ingest other things in your art career. Yeah. Because it like kind of puts a stifle on your style almost. It like puts a kink in it, right? Yeah, but that, that step that step of stopping watching things and stopping and looking at things in order to make art is very uncomfortable and really hard to do. But if you do it over and over again, you get used to it. And then you're like, oh, I'm making my own art. Um, but there's also like, I don't know. It's good to also continue to learn. So it's just a journey. Okay, I feel really happy with my leaves. I love that. If you want to go even darker, wait for that to dry and do one more layer on top, but I'm actually gonna leave mine. I, I really love the color that I got on that. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move on to step five where I'm gonna do my um, texture on my basket. You can use your six or your 12, and I need to mix more of that kind of tannish color because I want this to be a darker value than what I have here. So I'm going to, I have like a bunch of puddles of mixed color and I'm just gonna start bringing them to the center. Um, so I'm just gonna swoop, bring that in the middle. Okay, that's pretty much honey. So let's add a tiny bit of Payne's Gray and let's add red because Payne's Gray and honey or yellow tend to lean green. And I want to neutralize that green and to neutralize green, you add red. If you don't have red, magenta also works, pinks. Okay, I feel like it needs to be even more gray. So more Payne's gray. There we go, that feels really good. And then let's add some water to it and see where we end up. Is that too vibrant? No, I think that's good. I think it's gray. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now, like all of these white sections that we left, you have to think about how when a basket weaves, it's going out and in. And the areas that are going in, we communicate that by darkening that value. The basket parts that are going out should be the lightest value. So I'm gonna work around here and basically just go through these sections. 
where they meet up and put in this dark value. And then to get some texture, because that feels like really disjointed, right? Where you're like, that's that feels too separate from each other. I'm going to take my brush, hit it on my paper towel to get rid of all the excess moisture, and then use this dry brush technique to get some texture onto my basket, okay? And so we're just gonna repeat that all the way around. It's crazy, and I've watched you paint a million things, but how much the last detail step makes the painting. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes, I do know what you mean because I feel like, and you guys probably know this because you've watched some of the tutorials, but I'll be like, don't give up yet. This is going to look really weird until this last step. So just stay with me until then. You spend 90% of the time doing all the foundation work. Mm -hmm. And then the last 10 minutes, you throw on some details and boom. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of bleed proof white here and there. And it's like, it's a good painting. Bada bing, bada boom. I will also say that I have had to like switch up how I taught animals because I would always do the eyes last because you want those to be like the sharpest part of your painting. Um, but animals look super, super creepy until you put in the eyeballs. And I realized when I was like teaching that way that a lot of people would get so um, like defeated and bummed out feeling that they're like, I've been working on this for an hour and this looks super weird, I'm so sad. And they hadn't put the eyes in. And I'm like, oh, it's cause you haven't done eyes yet. And so I try and switch up the steps. So then you guys, like, you know that you're working towards something that you'll feel good at at the end. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Okay, and then if you want like little hints of extra saturation, you can grab some of that honey and do like add that to the dry brush if you want. Here and there, it's not um, necessary, but if you just want that stronger hint. And you can do like sections at a time. So I'm kind of just doing this all here. And then dry off your brush and kind of smear that texture and that color around. And let's say you're doing that and you're losing the darker value edge. You can always go back and kind of like put it back in on some of the areas. Not, don't feel like you have to do this exact kind of dark thing on everyone. Sometimes, and this is just stylistic preference, but sometimes just the hints here and there is just the information that the viewer needs. That's enough information for the viewer that they can understand. We're getting close, you guys. I know this is a long project. Didn't help that I chatted you up for 10 hours. <laughs> I stayed painting during that whole time, I think. So you're good. There's a basket of toothbrushes over here. Do you have any idea why there's a basket of toothbrushes? Yes, um, I believe the kids tutorial used toothbrushes to flick paint. <laughs> okay. Just need a quick toothbrush in between tutorials. You can just come over here and scrub, scrub. Yeah, if actually you guys need a way to like um, splatter stars in like night paintings, toothbrushes work great. Isn't that interesting how just that dry brush like adds so much? Like look how barely there this part of the basket looks. Yeah. Okay, we are almost done with this portion. You can also, I, um, we didn't use a wash brush in this project, but if you have like a half inch wash brush, that would probably be a great way to paint these chunks because you can just use that kind of square um, brush stroke to 
get these. Okay, and then we're gonna dry brush, dry brush, dry brush. When you paint, do you use it as like meditation time to think about stuff? Or are you just thinking about painting? Like right now is the Harry Potter Hogwarts video game running through your head? Or are you just thinking about painting? I'm just thinking about painting. That's nice. I mean, but I'm also teaching. <laughs> right. But also the Hogwarts game. Yeah. But also that Harry Potter Hogwarts game is super fun and I've been playing it. <laughs> okay. So this section is a lighter value than this section as a whole. And I don't want them to feel like that separate from each other. So I'm just going back in and doing um, a slightly darker layer, at least on the part where this part and this part meets under the handle. Um, because it's okay if like this side of the basket is a different value, whether lighter or darker, but you wanna make sure that this is a continuous feel along this side. Okay, and I just lost some of my shadows, so I'm just gonna put some of those back in. Now, if you want to have like that full, like more realistic feel, then basically you would paint each section and have a smooth value transition from dark to light to dark on each kind of woven section. So if that's something you're interested in, totally possible, that's how I would go about doing it. And now I'm just gonna kind of like go along the top of the edge because where my kumquat bled a little bit, I'm gonna tighten that up. This handle, I'm gonna, I want this to kind of stick out a little bit more. Sorry, I gotta lean. Okay. This handle also deserves some love. I used to giggle when you would do the leans or the tongue out or the eyebrow furrow, but you know what? That actually is the magic. <laughs> That's right. Okay, look at my basket. It's cute. Um, now we're on our very last step. So this is kind of where you step back and you take a look at a whole, at the whole thing. And you say, okay, um, how do these things feel together in space? Um, what can I do if I need to like adjust anything, that kind of stuff. So I need to put the little dots on the basket, but before that, I'm just gonna kind of like look at how my basket lines up on my stripes and maybe kind of darken some a little bit. Also right here underneath my kumquats. Okay. So these actually I think did pretty good, but I'll just do one more swoop. Feels good, that's shadow. I mean, I think that looks pretty good. I did lose like this stripe back here. Okay, let's add a little bit of extra shadow on that, on those kumquats, if you want. So I'm doing like a reddish brown. And remember there's variation in shape, color, value, all that fun stuff. I'm gonna tighten some of these white lines, thin them out if I can. And the shadow on this would be kind of on this underneath part here, going up and around. Okay. 
Okay. And then I'm gonna add the little gray dot. So I'm just gonna do Payne's gray and add some water to that because it's like these little, I don't know, are these nails? Yes. And I'm kind of just following the reference photo because my line disappeared with my wash. Okay. And then very last step, I'm gonna grab my two, makes a very, very dark green. Actually gonna leave that white, I kinda like that. And there it is. Beautiful. That is our basket. Now I, uh, I think the magic of this project is actually when you take the tape off, so that's what I'm going to do. But before I do, I wanna make sure that I have a consistent line along the basket. The blanket, I'm not as concerned about, but making sure that it's kinda tan all the way through so I get that clean edge against it is nice. Okay. So when you pull tape away, you wanna do it at a 90 degree angle. You wanna pull away from your painting. You're telling me that whole buying soft tape is worth it. Yes. I am telling you, I'm looking at you in the face and saying this tape is worth it. You're pretty, you're pretty laissez-faire about what brushes to use and use the paper you have, but that tape, you gotta get that tape. I just have never experienced, I mean like it is a rare day where I rip with this tape and I always get a clean edge, always. Mm -hmm. Like other tapes, Maybe they wouldn't tear as much, but a clean edge was really difficult to guarantee. With Holbein soft tape, it's like so rare that I um, get bleeds. You're telling me that the coven, the Holbein coven is doing good magic? Yes, they are. Yeah, I don't know how they do it. I probably wouldn't understand it if they explained <laughs> it to me. All I know is I love it. They just lick all the tape. <laughs> That's what the secret is. Okay. Dang. There it is. That's a basket. And don't you, isn't it interesting how like even in this area, you're like, oh, it's probably not even going to show up, but the shadows stick out more against that white paper. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just, um, gosh, it's just fun. So I... I know that this is a little bit different than what we usually do, but I hope you guys can get some insight of how even with really vibrant colors, you can still absolutely get a more vintage kind of feel, desaturated tones, and it's always a good idea to mix it up. I fell in love with watercolors because of their vibrancy. I mean, I'm sure you guys heard this story where I painted a carrot with liquid watercolors and I just about died with how like, I, I just wanted to paint everything. Um, but it's so good to do something different than what you usually do because um, that's how we stay engaged is we switch it up and we challenge ourselves and we continue exploring and trying new things. Um, if you're on Instagram, you can tag us um, at let's go make art or hashtag let's make art. We love to see what it is you're painting. And I just noticed this white section that was bothering me. Um, if you are on Facebook, you can join our Facebook community. It's a large group, but very kind, very supportive. That's called Let's Make Art Watercolor. And if you need any of these supplies, you can find them at letsmakeart.com. Michael, thank you for bringing all of your knowledge and questions. You're welcome. We appreciate it. And I will see you guys next